Round of applause for Stephen, everyone. Let me introduce myself and start off by saying that I started off this morning in Guangzhou at 4 a.m., took a train down here. Uh, I started looking at my slides to get myself prepared for this. By the second slide, I was sound asleep. So that kind of sets the bar really easy. If you guys are still awake at slide three, I have succeeded. Thank you. Uh, most people know that I love retail, not just Amazon. But what a lot of people don't know is I've probably been on Amazon FBA longer than anyone in the room, and possibly longer than anyone you've met. I started on Amazon FBA in October of 2006, less than 30 days after the service was launched. Now, before you all think that I'm the super expert on Amazon FBA, I am not, because soon after that I went to Amazon Vendor. But I do have, have that little bit of a uh, uh, thing to boast about. So, I'm going to talk about negotiating. I'm going to talk about negotiating with your Chinese supplier. I've been doing this for a few years. Uh, I worked at Microsoft for 12 years. I was business manager in two different divisions, both multi-billion dollar divisions. They taught me to negotiate. I've negotiated in Japan, China, and so on. And I'm here to talk to you about some basic tips and some tricks that you can use talking to your suppliers. So how many people enjoy negotiating with your suppliers? One, two, three. My job is to negotiate and get more people to say yes. All right, so we look at negotiation as a long dance. I'm co-founder of a group where we uh, help people get into uh, retail as well as Amazon, kind of expand the revenue streams. We train people for two months before we bring them to China. And in that, we actually spend a lot of time on negotiation. And then when they get to China uh, and they start sourcing, we help them with that as well. We're going to talk about that more at the end. We even give you a discount. So let me find a little clicker here and start talking about the long dance. There we go. So if you think of negotiation as a dance, it's a partner, it's two people, there's a choreography. One gives, one steps forward, one steps back, and so on. It's really communication. It's a conversation. You guys both have goals. The factory owner is a real person with a family and kids. They want to pay the rent. They want to pay the mortgage. They want to put food on the table. And when you look at them as, as a real person, you have a conversation, the goal of that negotiation now changes. It's no longer who gets the best price, how do I knock down the MOQ, it's a relationship. And when you think of the relationship as the goal of negotiation, it takes on a different tone. Uh, I'm from America, obviously from my accent. In English, we've got thousands of more vocabulary words than the Chinese do. But the Chinese have one word which we don't have in English. And that word is guan xi. And that means a business relationship. That's how much they value that business relationship. And that's where your goal should be when you start to negotiate. So let's start off with some basic steps that you guys can take, oh, I'm making shadow up there, that you guys can take advantage of when you start your negotiation with suppliers. Number one, be prepared. Know your product, know how the manufacturing is done so you can discuss that, know what your target price is on, so on. And then when you talk, don't make the first move. Let them make the first move. Whether it's price, MOQ, just discussions, once you've shown you're interested, let them start the dance. And now this is something you've probably heard before, but it's worth repeating. Negotiation is more than price. And you can certainly negotiate more than price. Is the price too high? Perhaps there are some things that you can take away, such as extra long life batteries. Or if the price is good, maybe you could add something into it. That's there too. Silence. One of the best things we hear from, from our students and entrepreneurs that come on the Canton Fair Experience is they're amazed when they sit down with a supplier and they start talking to just be silent. And if you're uncomfortable with silent, take out your phone. Type some numbers in. Make a mmm noise. 
whatever you want. But they'll think you're calculating things out and everything. The more silence that there is, the more they're uncomfortable. So they're going to come back. And when you give them a, a target price and you want them to get closer, silence makes them think that you're looking at their response and you're not happy. And lastly, really powerful. You're going to see downstairs there's lots of suppliers. If you go to Canton Fair, you'll see lots of suppliers. If you look on Alibaba, you're going to see lots of suppliers. There's always another supplier. So be prepared to walk away. If you have the ability to walk away, in your mind, you're always in control of the, of the uh, negotiation. So there's some basic tips and tricks. Now let's talk to you about how you actually start this out. Talking with Chinese suppliers. Keep the language simple. No contractions. That's easily confused. No slang. They might misinterpret it. If you're using email, number your questions. And you can come back and refer to that number. So right there you have three. I broke the thing, by the way. Right there you have three methods right away to help you communicate better. Know your target price. So how do you come up with your target price? Does anyone know? I want to hear it. No hands. Just shout out yes if you know your how to get to our target price. Yes. All right, we got one. <laughs> All right, and, and again, I'm framing this in the fact that I sell through multiple channels, retail as well as Amazon. When you have a product that is a unique product, you know what customers are ready to pay for it, use your multiplier. If you're aiming for 7x, divide it by 7. If you're aiming for 10x, divide it by 10. That's the right price. One-tenth or one-seven of what people are willing to pay for it, that's your target price. So when you go into that negotiation, know your target price and come in a little bit below it. And the third point up here is questions you don't want to be asked. Have you ever been in a negotiation and they ask you a question that you really don't want to tell them? Where do you sell? How much do you sell? I see some heads shaking up and down. I'll take that as the voices of people saying yes. Be prepared with those answers. And here's a trick right away to save you money. There are different levels of selling products. And each level has its own price constraints. So the lowest level is selling wholesale to retailers and distributors. You have to have the lowest price because wholesale, uh, retailers and distributors are going to buy from you. And they usually keystone, which means double the price. The next level are those people who are distributors. I'm going to buy a bunch of your product because I'm a distributor. The next level up is the retailers. They only have to double the price. And then they're making money. And the level at the very highest are Amazon sellers. Because Amazon sellers will often only sell 15, 20, 30 percent above the price. They know they shouldn't, but when they get into a competitive spot, they do. So therefore, if you identify yourself right away, say, where do you sell? Oh, I sell on Amazon. Then the supplier knows that you'll accept prices all the way up to here. If you tell them, I'm a wholesaler, I sell to retailers, they'll know that you have very low uh, price requirements, and they know that they can't bring that price up too high. So there's a hint right away to, to save a little bit of money. Next, kings. Dance with kings. Chinese suppliers, Japanese suppliers, Vietnam, and so on. Kings negotiate with kings. I know a lot of people have been advised to do a business card where they say they're a purchasing agent or something for a large corporation and kind of come in humble. And humble is good. But the owner is sitting in a booth and he's got a couple of people who work in college who speak English better than them. They're low, he's high. If you want to come in and talk to the decision maker, if you want to be the decision maker, then present yourself as a decision maker. Be the king just like the owner is the king. And you have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. You'll get a lot further. Next, be yourself. Be honest. Don't, uh, don't inflate things. That's OK. They are people just like you. In fact, we had some factory owners uh, over to dinner in Canton Fair Experience just so people could meet them over dinner and get a chance to socialize and understand 
They are human like everyone else. So you're the boss, you're the decision maker. How many people here are married? Yes. All right, there we go, we got more yeses. So you're the boss, you're the decision maker, but it's okay to be married, which means you can tell them, oh, I still need to, this is great, I just need to check with my partner, my whoever, and, uh, and come back to you to confirm everything. So you don't have to lock yourself in if you're not comfortable with that. More dancing. Where do you place your, your feet? So we talked about target price. Know your target price. Know the components you can live with or the components you would like to add. Because when you negotiate, you can use those as throwaway items. You can take a, um, a, a Bluetooth, if you have a Bluetooth speaker, you might want to take the little input, the RCA jack input off the Bluetooth speaker and save some money and so on. So know your product, know the components, <coughs> know your payment terms. How many people here are paying on terms, not just 30% and 70%? I want to hear yeses. Good. How many people are not paying on terms? Nobody. Everyone here is paying on terms. I love it. That's excellent. As we try to explain to everyone, when you negotiate, also negotiate terms. Because if you're not going to bring them up at the beginning, when are you going to bring them up? At least you can tell them that on your second or third order, you expect to be paying zero up front. By your fourth order, you expect to be paying 30 days after receipt. By your sixth order, 60 days after receipt, and so on. So I love that you guys all pay on terms. Same thing, MOQ. Is MOQ really part of the discussion? No. That's often just a gatekeeper. Uh, type of a question. Now there might be minimums on packaging or labor, particularly with, with custom uh, products, but there are always ways of talking around the MOQ. In fact, if you're trying to, if you have someone with a high MOQ, here's more actionable advice right here. If you have someone with a high MOQ and you can't make it, by the time you've already agreed on a price and then you place your order, they're going to say, oh my goodness, that's that's below the MOQ. Just ask them, okay, what's the surcharge? And I'll tell you, okay, it's $4 per item, but the surcharge, because you're under MOQ, is going to be a dollar, dollar fifty, whatever. Say, so, okay, great. Can I have that refunded on my next order when I'm over the MOQ? Say, so, yes. So now your net bottom line is you're paying that low price for all of your items. And if you've done your research beforehand, you should be confident you're going to be selling. Uh, those items and making additional orders. And if not, walk away. There are always other manufacturers. Same thing for thresholds. Hey, I've ordered 500 now. I expect that we're going to be ordering more in the future. What, at what thresholds do my price come down? Does my price come down at 1,000? Does it come down at 1,500? So that you negotiate right up front where your price drops are. We're all in this to make money, but you want, you want to be happy, you want to make them happy, but you want to make money. Nonverbal communication. How many people here do not speak Chinese? Okay, yeses, yeses, yeses. You can still learn from them. When you ask them a price, do they kind of look up in the air? Do they make it up? Or are they looking at a piece of paper and giving you an exact number? Are they giving you a number that ends with a zero and turning around in their calculator? It's like, one dollar, 150, whatever. Right away you know that this is a number you can negotiate down. So look for the nonverbal communication. And right in there as well, and we'll come back to this later, yes does not always mean yes. Everyone knows this by now, correct? Exactly. Yes means yes, I've heard you, I acknowledge you, but not agreement. So always come back, rephrase it, put it in writing, ask again, because yes does not always mean yes. Don't trip on your feet. All dancing analogies today. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> as we said, know your target price. You know how to reach that. Don't future promise. Don't say, oh, give me this price today and I'm going to be doing 2,000 more units next month. I actually had one of my investors come with me on a visit to a factory one time. I left to use the restroom. I came back and everything was signed, sealed, delivered. That's great. 
And when I was ready to pay, they said, but what about the, the down payment on your next order? I said, what order? They actually have videotape in the conference room at the factory. They replayed the whole thing, and it was like, oh my goodness. He had promised a future order while I was gone, and he was one of my investors. And luckily, we were able to clean that up, but it was not a good situation. Be knowledgeable. We talked about that already. And this is China. So save face. How many people know what it means to save face? Yes. Someone shout out what it means. Don't embarrass, Don't embarrass them. Great. Any other examples? Respect. Respect. Excellent. These are businessmen, but they've been doing this for years thousands and thousands of years. And their ritual, the idea of treating someone with respect, don't embarrass them. That's very, very important. OK, so I'm not sure what my timing is. I'm going to just keep on going until you kick me off. <laughs> the next is own the dance floor. So now you've got this going. You've got this wonderful dance of negotiation. And now you're starting to grow. Size is everything. So as you increase in size, of course, you're meeting these thresholds. Your prices should be coming down. MLQ is no longer part of the discussion. As you're able to ship in containers, your cost for shipping comes down. Your profit's going up. As you get into retailers and you increase with retailers, Walmart will tell you once you hit over a million dollars in sales, they expect the price to come down. It's perfectly OK for you guys to tell your suppliers that as you hit certain thresholds, the price is supposed to come down. But as you grow, you own that conversation. And do I have a few minutes for some questions and answers? Excellent. So who wants to talk about negotiating? I have 20 minutes. My goodness, that's the best half hour I ever did. So let's get some questions and answers. Let's talk about some practical tips. All right, in the light green shirt. What's your name? Joe. Joe, hi, Joe. It's, th yeah, 3070 is kind of the one that's talked about in a lot of YouTube videos and so on, but it's absolutely not a standard. In fact, it wasn't a standard until a number of years ago when those YouTube videos started. You are in control. You can set it up as 20, 40, 40, and so on. You can have a percentage up front because they have raw materials. You can have a larger percentage after it passes successfully inspection, and then a final percentage upon FOB, a bill of lading if it's FOB, or delivery if it's DDP. How many people realize if you're shipping DDP, you don't own the product until it's handed to Amazon? So usually you don't pay until you own a product. And in the case of FOB, that means upon receipt of uh, BOL. So I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sure your question was more than that. No, I, I wanted to see the areas of the standard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then as you go forward, you can also switch that out. Perhaps that last 40% is, is 30, 30 days after receipt. So you're always going to ask. Unless they say it's impossible, keep asking. Yes, back there. What's your name? Hey, my name is Florian. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the nice presentation. Um, there's always I love doing this, i got to tell you. <laughs> there's always more to learn on, um, on uh, sourcing, and some things need to come back into your mind. Um, I really like the idea, the, the little tip or hack uh, to say that you're a wholesaler and then um, they're, they're expecting, they, they might have a lower starting price or whatever. I would add into if you would say, which I don't have the right face, but if you say I'm, I'm selling in Africa, they probably started a lower price as well. But um, then the problem is, in the next slide, you said, be honest. I, mean, I, can't, I can't come up with something like that and then say, well, I mean, I'm selling on Amazon the next day. So what, what, what is your suggestion on that? I mean, I want to be, be clear. I want to say what I'm doing. But I also kind of, you're right, saying things where they might start at a lower price. So I should pay you for saying that. <laughs> yeah. I had made this, sli I made this slide deck a lot longer. And that was actually a slide in there. So I suggest that, you know, say that you're, you sell wholesale, and the next slide would be, and you should. 
you should definitely sell wholesale. And if you don't sell wholesale already, here is a very easy way to learn about selling wholesale and to, to get started yourself. Walk out your door, get in your car or walk down the street and find your local store that would sell something that you sell. If it's a, a supplement, find a, a local supplement store. If it's something uh, that could be sold in a gift store, find a local gift store. But find someone who's close to you, walk in, say, I've got this product and I'm selling it online, but I'd like to sell it to retailers. What do you think? What should the price be? What would you change or so on? Would you like to try to sell this? Maybe they'll say yes and you get your first wholesale customer. Maybe they say no and they'll tell you why and now you've learned. But the moment you walk in that door and you say, would you like to buy this? You are now a wholesaler. May not be a successful one, but you're a wholesaler. And now you have that knowledge that comes into the conversation. And they'll say to you, oh, you're a wholesaler. Uh, what do you sell? Oh, I sell these things, whatever they are. Um, but I'm looking to change them a little bit because of, and you have the feedback from, from your local store. So absolutely, I encourage you to try wholesale. You will find it addictive, I, I guarantee it. And you make more money. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Excellent. Hi, Stephen. My name is Gary. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, I, I was just curious, you know, given the, the trade war we're in with like the tariffs between China and the U.S., um, wh what's your, what would your advice be in terms of asking suppliers to try to share some of the tariffs, you know, if we're selling to the U.S.? I'm just curious. Thanks. A lot of people I know have had success with that. Personally, I don't go that direction. Uh, instead, uh, myself and, and all of our entrepreneurs, we looked. Uh, we normally would tell someone to source at a minimum minimum seven x. During this time frame, we're suggesting people source at a minimum ten x, so you can absorb any of those costs. But the reason that I don't say, "Hey, can you absorb some of this with me and, and partner with the challenges?" And if you tie your price to the current tariffs, and those tariffs go away or go down or uh, go back to normal then your supplier has the same right to come back to you and say, hey, now that things have normalized, I want to raise my price back up again. And that's a discussion I don't want to have. Chris. Hi, I'm hey, Chris. Um, this is kind of not uh, asking you a question, but you can elaborate on it a little bit more. It's just like another tip I come across. So my haircut? <laughs> um, some, some people ask to sell our, uh, like buy our products wholesale, and one interesting question I went back and asked them was like, oh, what other products do you buy wholesale at the moment? And then I was like, oh, and like, where do you buy them wholesale products from at the moment? And that led me back to find distributors of them type of products that I couldn't easily find online because they were like stores and they'd already found the distributors basically for us. Um, and that led us to have some good conversations with distributors. Um, uh, do you have any other tips about like how to find distributors for your products? So um, I want to be clear. First of all, thank you, Chris. <laughs> and I know that he has a lot of success doing this, so thank you very much. Um, finding distributors for your products, finding retailers that sell your products and so on, uh, within the U.S. market is a lot easier when you are within the U.S. Uh, if you're not there, try to schedule some time. Start off on the trade show circuit. Uh, if you do pets, you've got Super Zoo, you've got Global Pet Expo, and so on. I had a pretty good product that got some recognition at Global Pet Expo. And uh, in fact, we got second place of the best new product of the year. Um, and I was approached there, both by retailers and distributors. Distributors like Fetch, who sell into um, uh, Petco and PetSmart and these other places across the US. Uh, a small chain at the time in, in Texas of uh, pet stores that were then growing. Uh, Amazon vendor and so on. So a good place um, to start are those trade shows. They will come up to you. The other side of that equation I cannot help you much on, and that is people who are doing, who are buying from distributors and doing the wholesale Amazon uh, business model. 
uh, I'm on the other side of the equation, selling to those distributors that would then be selling onward. Did that answer the question? Excellent. This is fun. Other questions? What's the toughest problems or the toughest questions you've come up against when you're negotiating? What stumps you? I'm looking at people thinking, oh, the, the eyes are going up and down like you're trying to get it out of your mind. Yes? All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you try negotiating with me? Okay? You're the supplier. I'm the buyer. All right. We've talked a little bit. I'm buying this from you right here. Okay? Should he be a nice buyer or a terrible buyer? Terrible. terrible. <laughs> a buyer or a supplier? A supplier. Supplier. I'm the buyer. Okay. So you're a terrible uh, a supplier. Now, I got to warn you, as I warned, as I told everyone earlier, I can walk away, so you can't be that terrible. Don't <laughs> walk out of your booth. Have you lost 10 customers of Sandy? Yes. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I'll tell you right now, as I said, we had factory owners come in and have dinner with, with, with our members, and factory owners will tell you right away the scariest words they will hear when it comes to credit, the scariest words they will hear comes to a buyer having a stable business who can pay their bills or I sell on Amazon. As soon as you say that, they're frightened that you're going to go out of business. You may not be able to pay your bills and so on. So that's one another reason why we're talking about saying that you sell wholesale. So we'll start the conversation and I'll talk to you about my business. I'll talk to you about other factories. Um, as we have that conversation back and forth and I say, well, I'll buy my third uh, order, I expect to uh, start with 100%, uh, with 0% up front and 100% after delivery. By my fourth order, we be, should be looking at 30% terms. Your turn. So you say that right away? Yeah. Am I at a trade show? Or am I, is this email? Is this, is this? Once I'm settling out the deal. So that could be if you're buying at a trade show, yes. I encourage people to settle the deal either while visiting a factory or during negotiating by WeChat. Okay. video at home, but after you already established that relationship, because you can certainly continue that. But okay, when you're so ready to sign out that deal, before I submit that deal and I ask them to put their stamp on it, I absolutely talk about terms. Okay. So you'll pay me up front 30 70 on the first order, and then by the fourth, it'll be 100%? What was... You said there was like a plan? You had a plan? Right. So on the first order, we'll do whatever it is that's the down payment and the balance before shipping. Okay. Absolutely. Second order would be the same thing. By the third order, though, I expect to be paying zero up front and 100% before it ships. Okay. This is what I do with all my other factories. All right? Okay. So third order, is that in a year? Is that in two years? When, what's your order frequency? Well, it depends on the product, but... I don't go into um, products unless I know I can start ordering by the container load right away, and I expect multiple containers within the first year. If we can't get there, I'm not starting it. But okay. if you're starting off small, you can still play the same game, and you can let them know what you expect. You can already project out what you're going to be selling. So you can tell them, I'll be, I expect to be doing my third order uh, within the next four or five months. Okay. And by my third order, I expect to to pay 100%. By my fourth order, I expect to be paying uh, payment terms and so on. So the terms you, you'll pay me as a supplier before sh leaving port of China, FOB Ningbo or something? So uh, FOB is upon bill of lading. Mm -hmm. And that bill of lading can be sent by telex or physical. No one does feels physical anymore. Everyone does telex. So usually that boat's already on the, on the water by the time the, the uh, bill of lading is sent out to you. Okay, so you'll pay me as a supplier when it's on the water, when I, 100%. Right, and that BOL actually transfers ownership from you mm -hmm. to me. So you're absolutely safe on that. So then I'm just taking a risk on the material cost. I'll be paid before it's landing in port. Right, at that point, that risk is still minimal. You're taking a risk on the material cost, cost because perhaps it doesn't pass inspection, but that's your problem. Yeah, so if you don't... My risk is if you don't pay me on water, I'd have to, I'd own it. It would be mine and your destination country. Correct. Could you just say no to the proposal, say no to the package you put together, 
So your shipper knows the final address, not your manufacturer. So they're not going to find out like that. And the packaging, even if it's in a corrugate box, that's often done uh, by manufacturers. You can include that in the negotiations. It's an, in a, a PP bag, a, a poly bag in, in a corrugate box, and you can say what type of corrugate you want. Do you want B flow flute or B and E flute? And that's up to your, that, that your manufacturer will do. As far as putting the little uh, Finskew labels on it and so on, don't have your manufacturer do that. Um, have a prep center do that. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. I yes. Have, I have a f another question. Good. Um, I'm loving this. is great. Yeah, since you're also enjoying it so much, I'm enjoying it too. Um, um, it's making me happy that I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it, yeah. Um, I know it's a silly question, but I um, just want to ask it anyway. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to learn as much as, as possible about my industry and about my product. Uh, it still takes a while. I mean, be prepared and be knowledgeable. It, it's not like you read a book and all of a sudden you know all the little details about fabrics and different materials and stuff. Um, Do you sell fabric uh, products? Yeah. Um, but um, so the question is like, you want to have trust and you also want to have these two contracts. Um, I mean, I can, I can spend a lot of time writing that contract or asking people to write it or whatever. And then I would have this perfect contract with, with all little specifications, which should be done, I know. And I know if guys that do it a lot, for them it's much easier. It's really quick to write that up and have that ready. You know, you have a template. But then on the other hand, I mean, if they want to screw me, they can screw me. And then um, even if I have the perfect contract, they might say, well, it was different or whatever, you know. So how much value do you still give that contract and how enforceable is it in the end if um, compared to the trust? So I'll, ask, I'll answer the second question first. It's very enforceable if done correct. And then the first question is how much value? Around $800. That's the value. Because that's the cost of you having a Chinese attorney write this up. You don't have to write this up. These are standard documents that Chinese attorneys do all the time. They're getting more scrutiny right now in the middle of this trade war. But you have a Chinese attorney. Why? Number one, in China, again, particularly because of the trade wars right now, Whereas they used to accept English agreements, now they want Chinese language agreements. The English uh, copy that comes along is just for convenience. Has to be signed by the Chinese company with their stamp. There is no signature, the company has a stamp. Has to have the Chinese name of the company. I have a, a factory uh, and their name is a Disney character. That's not really their name, that's just the English one for us to talk about. And their son, Eric, liked this Disney character. So you have to have the Chinese name as it is properly registered. You've got to have the right jurisdiction, and you've got to have penalties written in there. You're not expected to know this. You hire a Chinese attorney who puts this whole thing together, and then when it is done correctly, they know it's very enforceable, just like your NNN. Get it done correctly, it's a few, it's a few hundred bucks, but it is so worth it. So do you enforce it sometimes? Do I enforce it? Actually, I've, been, I've only had one problem with a factory and out of sheer coincidence it ends up being a textile factory. At the time I was new and I had a China, uh, textile factory in uh, Shenzhen, I wasn't aware that I should be looking up in Wuxi area and so on for uh, home textiles. And it was a complete mess. Luckily I have an agent in China and he went over there in person and he talked to them and we resolved it without having to take it into the courts and so on like that. But yeah, they take these very seriously. Didn't have to. Well, once once they have the f the once they sign the document and you have someone who comes in and says, "Hey, you guys sign this. You agreed it's going to pass inspection. It's supposed to be a 330 thread count. It's a 285 thread count. We're not paying. We want our money back." And uh, uh, that changed. How much money was at stake? Not much. Uh, yeah, it wasn't much. It was like it was under twenty thousand. 
Thank you for letting me talk, everyone.